Hi guys, I forgot to record this this morning when I was doing it with first hour. So I'm going to come back and hopefully do it just as exciting as it was when I did it first hour. So, all right, we are on page seven. If you've already listened to um, Wednesday's lecture, we're on page seven and we are looking at the failures of the Articles of the Confederation. I think that's where I ended. Um, and what will happen is um, as those things begin to mount, the uh, economic problems, the debt piling up, lots of things will start happening to the people that live in these new United States, which leads us to the bottom of page seven, the most important rebellion in U.S. history. I'm going to say it's the most important. Um, typically during this time period without these, excuse me, without these missing Wednesdays, this will be the first opportunity that we would watch a little clip of a movie. And it comes from a series called 10 Unexpected Days That Changed America. And this is this is actually the first unexpected day that changed America because it's so uh, significant and important. So what begins happening to explain this rebellion called Shays Rebellion is during the Revolutionary War, the United States did not have money. They didn't have their own money. We don't have we didn't have banks. We didn't have currency. So state legislatures for their armies, their militias, were writing chits, little IOUs, and the military is called a chit, C-H-I-T. And so the um, military men kept accepting these with the idea and the understanding that when the war was over, things got settled, they could present these chits and get paid. And uh, what happened after the... Um, war was that no one had money. There's there's no money. And so state legislatures could not pay those uh, veterans, those Revolutionary War veterans, any money. And that's a really bad thing. But at the same time, in order to raise money, those state legislatures needed to collect taxes. And more importantly, at this time, really the only taxes that they have are property taxes. And so many of these uh, uh, Revolutionary War veterans live on small farms and they got tax or property tax notices and they can't pay them. So when you can't pay your property taxes, they foreclose on your home and they take it no matter how much your property taxes are. If your home, if your land is assessed at a thousand dollars and you only owe $10 on your taxes, they're going to take your land. And so that's what begins happening to many of these um, uh, American veteran or American veteran revolutionary war veterans is they begin losing their home. And so at the bottom of page seven, most, again, many, a whole bunch of them are ex revolutionary war veterans. Some went to debtors prison. So on the top of page eight, we begin this first rebellion as a new nation. And this is the thing that's important. Uh, as we start to move forward in understanding the way and the reason that the Constitutional Convention uh, occurred and how and why they were, the Constitution is written. Because these rebe this rebellion is going to be seen very differently than the rebellion like Boston Massacre, um, uh, Boston Tea Party, all those other types of rebellions. So it looks the same but it's going to feel very different to those people in charge. So the rebellion is led by Daniel, uh, Captain Daniel Shays. Uh, debtors demanded paper currency like we need money. And uh, in 1786, Shays is going to organize farmers to march on cities. And it is really important that you should note that the tactics that they're going to use should sound really familiar to you, right? They're going to attack courthouses because that's where all the proceeds uh, begin with, or I'm sorry, all the processes begin with foreclosure. They're going to tar and feather agents of the states. They're going to burn uh, buildings. That should sound really familiar to you as to how the same types of things were dealt with during uh, the American Revolution. So now they're going to march to Springfield. They're going to take over the courthouse. And when, when wealthy New Englanders hear all of this, they say, we're going to hire and fund a militia of our own. Forget this state militia. We're going to do that ourselves. We are fr frightened and afraid of this mob. And think again, mob. So 
Um, in January 1787, Shays, 1,200 farmers, marched on the arsenal. Four farmers are going to die. The rest will be scattered. The revolt is over. And uh, most importantly, Shay is going to be arrested and the uh, rebellion ends. The significance is big. The property class, think wealthy, feared that this revolution had created a mobocracy. So they began second guessing themselves like, what have we done? We've created these, these groups of people that think every time they don't like something, the course of action is to burn things, tar and feather things, shoot things, take over things. We can't let that happen. And we need to do something to stop that from happening. So it, again, is one of the most important rebellions because it directly leads us to the United States Constitution. Because what happens is this young man named Alexander Hamilton says, this isn't going to work. We need a strong central federal government. So Alexander Hamilton, under the guise of working to improve the economy, gets a commitment from several states that they're going to meet in Annapolis and rethink these Articles of the Confederation, rethink how they're working and, and retool them. And they show up. There's only five states show up. And Alexander says, this isn't enough. Let's, let's do this again in um, a year in Philadelphia. And let's rewrite the, the Articles of the Confederation. So everyone sends delegates except Rhode Island. There will be 55 people show up in Philadelphia, all appointed by state legislatures with the intent governing idea to overhaul the Articles of the Confederation, to rethink them, retool them. But the I express extent is to redo the Articles of the Confederation. That's not what they do. So 55 delegates show up on May 25th in the state house, and, and we know they know what they're doing isn't what they were supposed to do because all of this is in secret, right? They close up the windows. Um, they don't have any uh, minutes recorded. Every other one of these constitutional conventions, um, not constitutional, every, every one of those First Continental Congress, Second Continental Congress, we know everything because there was a secretary that recorded minutes. There is not a secretary that records the minute, of the, and it's one of the very few that isn't, mostly because we know that's not what they were supposed to be doing, and they knew they weren't supposed to be doing that. Most of all 55 delegates, high prestige, they were conservative. Um, Jefferson is in Paris having the time of his life getting ready to participate in the French Revolution and, um, and also running away from the American Revolution so he didn't have to fight. But um, these are all like-minded men. They specifically, on purpose, did not invite strong nationalist revolutionary figures like Sam Adams. Once the revolution is over, Sam Adams is just dismissed and left by the wayside. He does not get to participate his yeah, participate in any national events. He is a state legislature and he doesn't get out of Pencil, uh, Massachusetts. Um, Washington's going to be elected the chairman uh, again, based on his reputation from the Revolutionary War. Madison's there. Ben Franklin is there again. This is going to be Ben's last hurrah. He sleeps through almost the whole thing, but he wakes up at really important times. And again, on the top of page nine, sessions held in complete secrecy. Secret. Like nobody's talking about it. Nobody's writing it. The only reason we know anything at all is from James Madison's diary. And that leads us into James Madison, father of the Constitution. Three major concepts that Madison brings with him uh, that becomes part of the Constitutional Convention. National government should be stronger than the states. They realize at this point that that experiment with having a confederation of 13 equal states does not work. It doesn't work. People don't do what they, the states don't do what they need to do. There's no one that's in charge. And so it makes it too difficult to run a country in that way. So they know they need a strong um, national government. And this is really important. And you, you need to highlight this because this will become a major factor as we continue forward, that the federal government draws its power from people, not states. And that's why the Constitution begins, we the people. 
instead of we, the United States of America. Uh, it's not unintentional that it begins with we, the people of these United States. And it's really important that we know that straight away. We need separation of powers. That's Montesquieu, spirit of laws, that there has to be separation of what government in, uh, entities do, and we have to have checks and balances on those. Um, James Madison, again, the father of the Constitution, he did not write it by himself, but he's given that because his diary is where we get all of the information from. So Articles of the Confederation are gone done over we're not even going to try to mess with that we're going to start all the way over it went against congress's explicit wish to revise the government not replace it in effect u.s government was peacefully overthrown that's what some professors teach and it's kind of crazy but i just put it in there just for the sake so first big issue representation how are states going to be represented in this new federal government? And we've got two plans, a large state and a small state. And hopefully that says it all to you. Large states with giant population, they want representation. So the more population you have, the more people that you, or the more representation that you have. And, and large states love that. Phil, uh, Pennsylvania loves it. New York loves it. Virginia loves it. But our small states say, no, that's not fair. We're never going to be able to have the population that you do because our states are small and we can't grow or increase our size. We're land, we're locked in. Our, our state can never get any bigger. You guys can grow and grow and grow. So they said everybody should have an equal amount. And so what we get on the top of page 10, what is the first and most important part of the history of America that here I'll add my side note that has somehow been lost in the last couple of years, this idea of compromise. Compromise doesn't mean weakness. Compromise doesn't mean giving in. Compromise means recognizing that there are ideas that are worthy on both sides and that we need to come to a mutual agreement. Government has to be run on compromise. It has to. And for most of our history, it has. And this is the beginning, this great compromise. Other sometimes known as Connecticut compromise. It's produced by Roger Sherman. He's like, let's do both. We'll do both. We will have a bicameral Congress, a House of Representatives, based on representation. So that's based on population. And then the upper house will be the Senate. Everybody gets two. Everybody, no matter how big, how small, you get two. That representation is very important and that um, the representation represents the people. And it's also very important to note in your notes on 2C, every single tax bill originates in the house. Every tax bill. The president doesn't have a budget. The Senate doesn't have a budget. Everything with taxes comes from the House. It has to because that's the representation of the people. And you should, again, cause and effect. Why did they say that in the House of Representatives? It wasn't just a willy-nilly, let's spin the wheel and pick one. It was the idea, again, of why these colonists began their quest for independence in the first place. Taxation without representation. And so taxes are going to always come from the House of Representatives. And even in state assemblies, it always originates in the House of Representatives, the same. They knew they needed a strong independent executive branch, um, and that will be a president. It uh, takes them a long time to figure out what to call them. Uh, the president is the commander in chief. The president uh, uh, has wide powers to appoint domestic offices, including judgeships, and most importantly, electoral college. I would put a big box around the electoral college. So what did Shay's Rebellion teach these rich white dudes? We can't leave the power to the average person. Why? Because they are easily swayed by mobs. And so we must somehow have some kind of way to override or oversee a popular election. And we can't let people vote that way. And so the people that are going to vote for the president will be the electors. And those electors are based on representation in the uh, House of Representative, the Representatives and the two senators. So you add all those up together, that's how many electors you have. And the electors are required in almost every single state to vote for, to cast their electors uh, to whoever wins the popular vote in their state. And for the most part, that's always happened. Um, the next issue is going to be North and South, and that's the institution of slavery. 
Um, how are slaves going to be counted? The South says, but they are people, their population, they should count. The North says they're not citizens. They don't get representation and they're not citizens. And the South understands if we don't get to count these people, we're going to upset this slowly important balance of power. And we're going to be discussing that balance of power forever and a day as we lead up to the Civil War. This balance of power to protect for the South, it's to protect the institution of slavery. And so this compromise is called the three-fifths compromise in which we um, uh, inhumanely say that a African slave, an enslaved person, is worth three-fifths of a person. And uh, thus begins this continued quest of um, dehumanizing the institution of slavery. And so the South gets what they need, that population with including enslaved people um, and uh, to increase that balance of power. Those of you that have seen any of Spike Lee's movies, he has two production companies that I know of. One is called 40 Acres on a Mule, which you'll understand that one when we get to the Civil War. And then the other one is called the Three Fists, Three Fists Production, I think, which is from this uh, Three Fists Compromise. I'm dressed like this because today's Western day, so. This isn't my normal kind of plaid shirt attire. At the top of page 11, it is very important to note that the fugitive slave provision allowed Southerners to cross state lines to get their property. And that's important uh, as well. Um, checks and balances on page 11. There's uh, Baron Mon uh, de Montesquieu, Spirit of Laws. You have to know his name for this course as well. We've got three branches of government, the executive enforces, legislative makes, judiciary interprets. And one of the most important things of all of this is what's called the elastic clause. Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 18. Congress shall have the power to make all laws which are necessary and proper. This is what has created or has allowed the, docu uh, the document of the Constitution to be what's called a living document that through all of our nation, through all of the things um, that has changed our nation. And I'm not talking about, you know, any real social issues. I'm talking about space flight. I'm talking about cars. I'm talking about the internet. I'm talking about immigration, every possible thing that you can think of because the constitution says Congress shall have the power to make all things necessary and proper. So whatever is deemed necessary and proper for running the government, the constitution allows that. And it is the great intelligent foresight of the creators of this document to understand we're not going to know everything and we need something in there that will provide for everything. And so this necessary and proper clause is really vital and important. And then the last that we got to today is the supremacy clause that the federal government, the, the uh, constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land. Uh, it supersedes uh, state constitutions. It is the um, federal government's constitution that is the law of the land. When you, uh, when members of the military join the military and they take their oath, they don't take an oath to the United States. They take an oath to uphold and defend the constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Not, I take an oath to the, to the flag to the country, to the president, it's to the constitution. And be that also, that's what the president takes an oath, to uphold and defend the constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So that document is a really significant and important part of our history. It's one of the examples of the uniqueness and distinct characteristics of the United States. Um, and it's um, um, companionship with enlightened principles. This is a social contract. This is a social contract in action. And it's all of those things that we studied in AP Euro about the salon and enlightenment and everybody just talking about all these ideas. The citizens and the men of the United States of America put those ideals in action. And so again, it is something to be very proud of of your country that uh, these men with these grand ideas of democracy and republicanism we're able to do that. And that, this same document, is still what we use today. It's amazing to me. It gives me goosebumps. All right. So stopping this, thanks to Wyatt for reminding me and emailing me about, hey, send me the link because 
I did not do that this morning. So the bell's getting ready to ring. It's almost three o'clock. So I will see, or I will hopefully see you, Wyatt, tomorrow. And uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. Talk to you later. Bye.